Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we have a special update Mormonish edition for everybody today, don't we, Landon? We absolutely do. Got to talk about BYU. <laughs> we got to talk about all the church schools. That's right. Um, I'm sure most of you have noticed in, gosh, the Tribune, the Deseret News, the church news everywhere, they are talking about some updates and changes um, to anybody involved in the CES schools. Um, I went to BYU. I've mentioned this um, quite a bit. I worked at BYU. In fact, I thought about it today as I prepared for this podcast. I spent 18 years at BYU. <laughs> so I experienced a lot of changes. Um, I went through a lot of interviews to make sure I was worthy to be there as a student and an employee. So all of this is right up my alley. Now, Landon was a little different, right? You did not go to did any of these schools. Attend this CES school. So this all <laughs> seems strange and odd to me. <laughs> it does. When we talk like in conversation or out to dinner or something, and those of us that went to BYU and our friend group talk about it, Lan is just shaking his head going, I don't think I could have survived in that environment. <laughs> so. No, I know oh, I could, could not. Yeah, it's yeah, uh, well, you're a rebel. We know that about there's you. There's some weird you're... stuff going on there. So <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And, you know, there have been changes throughout the years. Like I said, 18 years at BYU, I saw a lot. Um, and now there are some pretty big changes that have happened. So we thought we'd do an episode where we just quickly put everything together, go through it, um, synthesize the data and give you the scoop on what's happening um, with all the changes to all the different policies and procedures at the church schools. So we made some slides, of course, so it can be easier to understand. So as the title says, big changes in expectations for students at all church schools. So there are three different things that have been revised in this update, which will take effect on August 31st. So um, very quickly here. So what has been revised? First of all, um, when you go to or attend any of these church schools, your ecclesiastical leader, your home ward bishop, has to give you sort of an interview and give you an ecclesiastical endorsement. You also have to have that for um, to work there as an employee. So in this case, they have changed the student ecclesiastical endorsement questions. So we're going to go into that later in the slideshow. The other thing that they've made changes to is the CES honor code. Now that's what you sign once you get into these church schools, you have to sign a code with a certain set of uh, criteria that you have to agree to meet. And that's called the honor code. So they made some changes there. And I think the one that made most of the headlines, wouldn't you say, Landon, they have made changes to the dress and grooming principles and expectations. I think this was most exciting to the kids, especially the ones at uh, BYU-Idaho. <laughs> oh, yes, it was. And this is the most overt change. You know, you can you can see this in the way that they dress. So we're going to talk about each of these um, components that has been revised in this new complete overhaul and update to the CES uh, expectations for students. Okay, so first we need to talk about why did they make these changes? So basically, so that everyone can feel the love, right? So we have a picture of BYU campus here where, like I said, I spent 18 years. And then we have one of my favorite pictures of Jesus. Um, a lot of faithful Mormons love this picture. I think I would point out, don't you think, Landon, would he be allowed on campus? on any of the campuses? No, he doesn't meet any of the requirements. <laughs> he doesn't seem to meet any of the requirements. And for those of us who are listeners, you know, he has the flowing dark hair and the lovely beard and kind of the twinkle in his eye. Now he does have perfect teeth. And I do know almost everybody at the church school seems to have perfect teeth. So that, that might get him in that alone. Yes. But that might get him else. in. So, so Landon, why don't you read this little statement? That, and again, as I said, these are uh, all of our little things that we're quoting are from either the church news or different media outlets that have reported on these big changes. So why are they saying they're making these changes? Yeah, they say our goal is that all students and employees feel the love of the Savior, experience the growth from applying gospel principles, and more fully realize the joy associated with being part of a covenant keeping community. That's right. That's and that was Elder, Elder Clark, Clark G. Gilbert. Yeah. G. Gilbert. Here's, he said that. So just to make everybody, you know, as the title says, feel the love by being able to keep these standards. So now we know why. That's great. Let's dive in. Yeah. I I guess that's a little weird to me because, uh, you know, for those who don't go to a church uh, school, do they not feel the love of the Savior or experience <laughs> growth while at school and no. attending their church meeting? Uh, or can you only no. do it by plot, by living by BYU's standards? Yes. 
Yeah. I feel like when you were at USU, uh, you did not fail the love. That, that yeah. must be what's implied. I don't know. <laughs> That's why our football program sucked. <laughs> That's why it never worked out. That's exactly right. So one of the other reasons, you can tell we're going to have a lot of fun with this episode. We can't stop laughing. So um, another reason that they made these changes is keeping it all the same. And we have a picture of some beautiful triplets that are graduating, keeping it the same. So um, they say that the language of the honor code has been updated to emphasize the role of the honor code in accomplishing the religious mission of the CES institutions. The honor code itself has been consistent across BYU, BYU-Idaho, BYU-Hawaii, and Ensign College for many years. And even with the updated language, the underlying principles and expectations have not changed. The, re re the revisions standardize the expectations across the church schools and are consistent with the principles taught in the church's for the Strength of Youth Guide that was updated in October 2022. So if you guys remember that, that was a pretty big deal, wasn't it, Landon? When they changed the For Strength of Youth, they really revamped that. They really changed that. Yeah, I think uh, the having multiple earrings and that kind of stuff is all removed. <laughs> so I think the kids were- And tattoos, a lot of that, yeah. right. And, and so I think they're trying to say here that although all the underlying principles have been the same in the CES system, different schools have enacted them in different ways. So you do definitely see a difference between, especially what you notice right up front is dress and grooming at the different schools. Um, you know, for example, I've heard that BYU-Idaho has been extremely, a little more rigid in their dress code, things like that. So I think this update and change is an attempt to try to make everything the same. So was this a revelation or was it a Qualtrics survey? <laughs> Landon, why don't you read what they told us about why and how they arrived at all these changes? Yes, CES conducted focus groups at Brigham Young University, BYU-Idaho and Ensign College to review, discuss and gather input from students in the development of these changes. I guess they excluded BYU. Why? I, I don't know why. Uh, right. The input of these randomly selected students was significant in developing and refining these updates. Students were enthusiastic about these adjustments and express their feelings that a focus on the savior combined with an emphasis on principles and expectations would elevate dress, grooming, and behavior as students become more intentional and take increased ownership for dress and grooming decisions. I, yeah, that's I, I it. So I, I think buy that. Uh, the, the students <laughs> were the students were enthusiastic in, in that it would that it would the dress code would would uh, help them become more intentional and take increased ownership. That doesn't sound like students that I. Yeah, own how you dress. And I guess now you have to say, let's see, HWJD, how would Jesus dress? Yeah. Maybe that's what we're all supposed to ask ourselves now. Well, I mean, if we dress like Jesus, that would be a whole different thing. But, but yeah, so the idea is like many, many times in the church, um, when there's a change, if you follow the path back, it's a survey, isn't it, Landon? It's, it's some kind of, ground up, you know, change that they have made because they've, I guess, maybe gotten wind that people are disgruntled or people want to see a change. So they'll take these surveys, put these surveys out here, and then a change happens. Do you, I mean, I've seen that a lot. Don't you think that happens? It, it does. I I always question how these surveys are done uh, and what yeah. how they ask the questions, because, you yeah. know, it, when it says that they're enthusiastic about these adjustments and express their feelings that a focus on the Savior combined with an emphasis on principles and expectations, that doesn't sound like something students would, you know, they're, they're going to want to dress down. They're going to want to wear yeah. shorts. They're going to want to, yeah. they want less. They don't, you know, they're going to school. They, they, uh, I don't think this big expectation on the Savior is their number one focus when they're going to school. I think they want right. a, an environment that's comfortable to them so they can learn. Yeah, and they're probably concerned about modesty. I mean, all most of the faithful young adults I know are very concerned about that. So so I don't know. And, and as you said, we don't know how the survey was worded. Sometimes it's very leading in RFN recently did an episode where he took a church survey and he just kind of took it right on his podcast. You can hear him typing, but you know, the questions were he'd say things like, I know how to answer this, but I don't know how to put my answer into the survey because it doesn't quite fit. So yeah, sometimes the surveys and the way that they're worded can be problematic, but apparently they did get input from students um, on what they'd like to see as far as the changes. So let's see what we have next. Okay, 
Uh, dress and grooming standards are a change. -in. So one of the first things that they changed, um, as we saw in the first slide, was the dress and grooming standards. And again, uh, to align it more closely with the strength of the youth pamphlet. So it says one change involves the dress and grooming expectations throughout the church educational system. Previously, those standards had varied by school, as we mentioned before. For example, flip-flops and shorts were acceptable at BYU, but not at BYU-Idaho. The new dress and grooming principles and expectations identify foundational principles and outline common expectations that will be implemented across all campuses. So we have some awesome pictures here. <laughs> These have been on social media. Uh, the difference between an Idaho, BYU, Idaho cheerleader and a BYU cheerleader. And the difference is pretty, pretty vast as yeah. far as what they're wearing. <laughs> to say the least, yes. Uh, it, it, it's almost like Amish cheerleaders versus yeah. uh, Division I uh, cheerleaders at, at school. Yeah. So. And for those that are listening, the BYU Idaho cheerleaders, they're wearing longer skirts with leggings. They're not showing any bare leg and they have sleeves, if not sleeves under sleeves. Full, full it looks length like. sleeves, yeah. Full length <laughs> sleeves. And then you see the BYU cheerleaders and they look just like you would see at any collegiate, you know, very short skirts and, and a sleeveless top. And they look exactly like you would see. None of them other. are wearing garments while they're cheering. That's for okay. sure. The, Let's the BYU Idaho way, cheerleaders yes. could be wearing garments. The yes. BYU uh, yeah. Provo, certainly not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and actually that comes up later as far as being garment ready. So that's interesting. So yeah. So one of the biggest changes was to the dressing grooming standards, trying to make everything all standardized. Um, Flip-flops, I guess now okay at BYU, Idaho, right? So that's good to know. Probably not in the winter time though. Not in the winter. Yeah. I was going to say that could be deadly <laughs> in the winter time. So um, neat and clean is hip is the title of this slide. And we'll have Landon read. This is right out of the dress and grooming standards. Um, what some of the, they keep calling them expectations, basically letting the students know what they assume and expect that they will do. So these are the uh, expectations for dress and grooming out of the new standards. Yeah. So the expectations are that for men and women, dress be modest and fit and style. Dressing in a way that would cover the temple garment is a good guideline, whether or not one has been endowed. Accommodations may be made for athletic participation. So that is your cheerleaders. The cheerleaders. cheerleaders don't need to wear. <laughs> Dress should also be neat and clean. Sloppy, overly casual, ragged, or extreme clothing is not acceptable. Mm -mm. Uh, that's pretty much the standard nowadays. The kids all have those ripped jeans and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kids today. <laughs> kids. The grooming expectations state that hair should be clean, neat, modest, and avoid extremes in styles and colors, and that men should have neatly trimmed hair and be clean shaven. If worn, mustaches should be neatly trimmed. I so again. Yeah, talk about that facial hair for men, Landon, because it's that no beard but mustache, and I see that everywhere now. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, I I didn't know they could uh, if worn mustaches. Yeah, so I yeah. guess you can have a porn stash. Yeah. Um, but I I I I worked at BYU Idaho as a contractor. Built we were building a, a building up there, and it was funny because I was uh, I I was on a ladder at the time. This was probably 50, is when they built the new uh, student union center. And I was up on a ladder and this kid came in and he he went up to they 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 were doing a missions. It was, you know, starting a school. And he came up and the lady said, Have you shaved today? And he said, No. And she's she sent him home. And I looked down and yeah. the kid was like 19 years old, probably could go yeah. three weeks without shaving. Yeah. Of course he noticed it. And they oh. said, Oh no, my couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah, uh, no. Poor kid. <laughs> No, there are horror stories like that. We have a kid in our neighborhood that, you know, probably mo the most upstanding youth I've ever seen. And he submitted his mission picture and he took the picture in his backyard. And I think it looked like there was some shadow on his face, but everything was rejected until he took a new picture. They're absolutely obsessed with the. I mean, you, Landon, are obviously an apostate because you have a full beard and a mustache. So. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly they are. And it is so the letter of the law. There's a famous uh, story event that happened at BYU 
in the 70s where somebody went to the testing center wearing jeans and she was turned away. So she had to take the test. She was wearing a long coat. It was in the fall. She went to the bathroom. She took off her jeans, literally <laughs> took the test in her underwear under the trench coat. And that was perfectly acceptable. So it's that letter of the law thing. But the other thing that stood out to me was the addressing in a way that would cover the temple garment is a good guideline. Now, I was raised that way. I was garment ready as a baby. <laughs> and I am not kidding. No, I'm not kidding. I mean, I can joke about it now. But one of the most daring things I ever did is I was in the band when I was in junior high. I played the flute and we went on a band trip and we had our own money and we were shopping in between, you know, concerts. And I saw a sleeveless porn shoulder top. I was 15 and I bought it. It was white lace. I'll never forget this. And I put it on in the hotel room, you know, and my friends were scandalized because they were also LDS. But I just remember the feeling that I got with that. It was just so different because as I said, I had been dressed garment ready from a baby, like never a sundress, nothing like that. Always sleeves, always everything very low. So yeah, I'll never forget that. And, and I think that's why it means so much to me today, just to be able to be myself, you know, but that was the only time in my entire growing up that I was very brave, very bold. And I bought a sleeveless shirt. Then I had to hide it like contraband in my room at home, never put it on again. But I did have that one moment where I, you know, I just kind of experimented a little bit. So, but here they're saying, you know, that it's better just to, in fact, I think I read something that said, if 90% of your wardrobe is already temple ready, then when you do go through the temple, you don't have to change anything. So that's another thought behind that. Yeah. And of course, this means, uh, you know, shorts have to be to the knee yes. length uh, yes. for both for both yes. uh, men and women. So, yes. Uh, and it does say accommodation may be made for athletic participation. But I think that also comes and goes, too, because I have a funny story about when I was newly engaged at BYU and my fiance and I were running and he was wearing, well, this is in the early 80s, so he was wearing dolphins. I don't know if you remember those shorts, very, very short, you know, and we're, we're out running. And the next day we were called in by the bishop and he goes, I saw you out exercising. And he, because my fiance was a return missionary, he, you know, really laid into him about the fact that he had not been wearing the garment as we were literally out running. So it's a thing. Wow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Landon's like, I'm so glad I didn't go to any of these church schools. <laughs> oh, very funny. But slot, okay. So in short, this is our next slide. In short, they can wear shorts. And that is what the headline is everywhere, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The headlines pretty much everywhere say that. Why don't you read that, Landon, what they're saying about shorts? Students on each campus will be allowed to wear shorts. <laughs> <laughs> Provided those shorts are keep in keeping with the principles and expectations given. As noted above, dress and grooming decisions should align with the dress and grooming principles and expectations, and application of these principles is not limited to the expectations list listed. Sounds like there's a lot of <laughs> expectations here. Yeah, I there are great <laughs> expectations. <laughs> great expectations, yes. <laughs> we are striving to create a culture that is consistent with the distinct religious purpose of CES institutions. Evidently, you can't wear shorts and have a religious purpose. Uh, well, and again, I feel like some people might get in trouble because so I put some extreme pictures here. And for those of you that are listening, I have a picture of the dolphin shorts that I described. There are some men in some very, very short shorts from the 70s, right? That's what everybody was wearing. And um, then I have the other extreme, which is a grandpa in long knee socks and some cute shorts, you know, way down. <laughs> and then I have a picture of, you know, just some students wearing shorts that are maybe mid mid thigh, some closer to the knee, some up. But again, I feel like it might be a roulette situation where a particular leader or teacher, you know, says that's not appropriate. And another one would say that is that is absolutely fine. So I don't I mean, and that that is true. When I went to BYU, um, the teachers themselves would look out for grooming and and dress violations, which was very funny. In fact, my then fiance was a theater major. And for one of the plays that he was in, and this is at BYU, he had to shave his entire head, except for a little fringe of hair around the bottom because they had to put a wig on and tie it on. So you can imagine how strange he looked, right? I mean, he was completely bald with a tiny fringe of hair around the bottom. And so he had to get a waiver from the administration office, a card that he could pull out because he was stopped everywhere we went 
a teacher or somebody would go, son, you know, thinking that he was trying to get away with some kind of weird, I don't know, monk hairstyle. I mean, that's all I can compare it to. It's like a monk. And he had to pull out this card, letting everybody know that, no, I've been authorized to have this extreme hairstyle. You know, I'm in the theater. As soon as they found out he was in the theater department, they went, oh, well, you know, that's a different story. You need to go down to that department, right? <laughs> but yeah, it's Athletes interesting. Athletes in theater, so, they could get away with anything. Yeah, they could get away with anything. So the other thing I will say about shorts and flip-flops, um, when I was in school, there was a big question about why boys could not wear um, sandals or flip-flops, but girls could wear open-toed shoes. And I've confirmed this with other people of my age. There was an article, and I can't remember if it was in the universe or perhaps um, the student review, um, that somebody in the administration was quoted as saying that on a man, leg hair is an extension of pubic hair. Sorry to say this on Mormonish, which is a G-rated show. But that was why. Because when a man revealed his leg hair, <laughs> this is in the day before shorts, you were seeing more than you wanted to see. So I am not kidding. This was the, I was just talking to someone of my age the other day and she goes, yep, I remember that. So, so is manscaping a requirement under the new? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently it would be because now you can wear shorts. So yeah, these, I know we're probably blowing everybody's mind. They're probably like, what in the hell are they talking about? But yeah, it's a very interesting world if you're connected to BYU, any of the BYU. So anyway, the good news is they can wear shorts and this is the headline everywhere, which makes us look, uh, I think, very peculiar almost to come out and say, oh, kids get to wear shorts. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I, I understand that there's a group that's kind of fighting against these shorts. That's true. That is very true. And this is at BYU Idaho, of course, because they're a little bit more rigid in their rules and they have called themselves the anti knee high Levi's. And they, <laughs> no, I'm totally kidding. But wouldn't that be great if that were true? No, I, I, I <laughs> we heard will they, not wear shorts. <laughs> I heard they're not fighting it anymore. They've buried the hatchet and the swords uh, and the spears and vowed to not fight anymore. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And I have to say, I did not come up with that on my own. A couple different people. I've seen that in different places. It's very funny. The anti knee high Levi's. So cute. <laughs> you have to laugh because it's just only so... a BYU. <laughs> that's right. All right. Let's see what we have next. Okay. Well, let's talk about uh, the neatly trimmed uh, paragraph that you read. It says, as stated in the dress and grooming expectations, hair should be neat and modest and avoid extremes. Um, the intent of this standard for men, of course, is that hair should be cut short and neatly trimmed. So again, all this is open to interpretation, you know? So uh -huh. there's a picture here with several different hairstyles and, and I, I, it's, I think it's going to be roulette as far as what teachers and leaders consider appropriate. Is, is chevrons in your head? Uh, yeah. is, is that extreme or, you know, what if you shave in a CTR symbol Would that yeah. be extreme? or a Moroni? Uh, yeah. Moroni, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know. And that's what I mean. If you think about my fiance back in the day, he was completely bald with a little fringe of short hair and yet they called him in. So I don't well, a couple of these look nice. I, I don't know, yeah. like the bottom left uh, guy there with just, you know, longer yeah. hair on top and then kind yeah, of. Yeah, but see, I don't know if you can shave on the side. That might that be considered extreme. That's what I mean. Well, what exactly. That, that's interesting to me because I was in uh, I, I was in the ROTC program uh, mm -hmm. at, at USU. And uh, I guess BYU has lost. Have they lost all the ROTC programs? Do they have one at uh, BYU Idaho? I, I I don't know. But I don't know. I know the one at BYU moved to UVU because of a situation where the person who'd been assigned to lead it would not sign the honor code because he drinks coffee, and so he couldn't be hired. So UVU picked up the program. So yeah, that that's an interesting story in itself it to is. relate to the it honor is. story, but uh, honor code. But uh, you yeah. know, we had to have military haircuts, and would that you know would that be considered a, an extreme? Uh, you know, it's short hair, but, uh, yeah. you know, high and tight. It's very short, like a buzz cut kind of. Yeah, I don't and, know. and I know a lot yeah. of the students that are in BYU or BYU-Idaho are probably also in the National Guard and, and whatnot and are required mm -hmm. to have those haircuts. Um, yeah. So it's interesting. Again, I don't know. It is very interesting. So, but they can, everyone can refer to the handbook and take it how they will. So, um, so that was the dress and grooming that changed, and that aligns with the aligns with the um, new strength of youth. So the other thing that they changed 
is they change the actual honor code. So the honor code, once you um, get into BYU or any of these church schools, you sign a code saying that you will abide by these standards and principles. So we dug out the honor code prior to the changes. And do you want to read through that, uh, Landon? It's basically you you just go through, you read the document and you sign. Yes, I agree to do all of these things. And then, of course, if you don't, they can throw it back at you and say, oh, you signed this. So what, what is it telling us that we need to sign in order to get into a church school? Yeah, so this is this was the requirements before the change. Mm -hmm. It was to be honest, live a chaste and virtuous life, including abstaining from any sexual relations outside of marriage between a man and a woman. Respect others, including the avoidance of profane and vulgar language. Obey the law and follow campus policies. Abstain from alcoholic beverages, tobacco, tea, coffee, vaping, and substance abuse. Participate regularly in church services required only of church members. Observe Brigham Young University's dress and grooming standards and encourage others in their commitment to comply with the honor code. I, I like okay. that. One. Encourage them. Yeah. <laughs> encourage is a, is a very strong word, and, and we're going to get into that later. But yeah, and as you can see, the dress and grooming standards are right there in the honor code. By signing this, you agree to everything we just talked about as far as the standards. So this is what you would have to sign and abide by prior to the changes. So now let's read the current one that's going to go into effect on August 30th with the new changes. And there are a few, they're subtle, and we'll go into those. Um, Landon, you can go ahead and read that again. This is what's going to go into effect on August 30th. Okay, so this is after. Maintain an ecclesiastical endorsement, including striving to deepen faith and maintain gospel standards. Be honest. Live a chaste and virtuous life, including abstaining from sexual relations outside marriage between a man and a woman. Living a chaste and virtuous life also includes abstaining from same-sex romantic behavior. That's a change. Mm, that's a change. Abstain from alcoholic beverages, tobacco, tea, coffee, vaping, marijuana, and other substance abuse. Participate mm. regularly in church services. Respect others, including the avoidance of profane and vulgar language. Obey the law and follow campus policies, including CES dress and grooming standards, and encourage others in their commitment to comply with the honor code and dress and grooming standards. Yeah, so so similar, very similar, but slightly different wording and some things added all together um, for kind of a different overall meaning. So let's dive into a couple of the things that stood out to us. And I would encourage any of you to read both just to get an idea of what exactly they're focusing on now as far as their goals and expectations for the kids that are attending school. So let's see. One of the first things that I noticed that I thought was very funny is that in the first one, the prior one, it said abstain from alcoholic beverages, tobacco, tea, coffee, vaping, marijuana, and substance abuse. Uh, okay. I don't think it included so, marijuana. I think they added marijuana in. Oh, did they? Okay, maybe one. they did. Let's, let's go back. Oops. We got to go back so we can get it right, not forward back. Okay, let's here go we go. Back let's look. Let's read this. See. Um, yeah, it was tobacco, tea, coffee. Yeah, no marijuana. Okay. Substance okay. abuse. No marijuana. Okay. So they so. added marijuana. But the other thing that I think is so funny is that instead of just saying and substance abuse, they say other substance abuse as if. <laughs> tea and coffee are considered now a substance abuse, which is why we have this funny picture of a man drinking literally out of a coffee pot, eating coffee grounds, you know, people looking hysterical over their coffee. So again, I'm just so surprised that they're doubling down on this because anecdotally, um, people that are in college, they are going to Starbucks. They have a different perception of what this means. A lot of them are okay drinking coffee. Um, maybe they're looking at it as the don't ask, don't tell, but haven't you noticed that Landon? It just seems so different than even a couple years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, a chai tea or, uh, uh, uh -huh. mm -hmm. cold coffee, iced coffee, yeah. iced uh, coffee. You get at McDonald's or any of those that, you know, <laughs> are uh, you talking about me? <laughs> I, I, I could be, but uh, <laughs> my beverage of choice. I know. I, I admit. 
Yeah, I, I like the, uh, the the caramel frappuccino, uh, and I think a lot of people probably like that. Uh, and that's not coffee, that's a dessert. I have a substance that's abuse a problem. dessert, yeah. <laughs> but just to say other substance abuse, you know, lumps it all together, you know, that I, I, I'd rather have my child, you know, vaping or doing marijuana than drinking coffee. I don't know. But well, anyway, it's, actually, it's there. It's actually funny because it's substance abuse problems that uh, go back to the BYU losing the ROTC program. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if you want to tell that story. Here. Yeah, it is an interesting story that I alluded to before. So as I heard it from different sources, um, the leader of the ROTC program is assigned, um, right? You probably know more than I do about that. Yeah, from the military Washington assigns from... them to the schools. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And in the last years ago when I heard this story, it was not a member of the church. And so in order to be a teacher or leader or professor at BYU, you have to sign the honor code. I had to sign it when I was an employee. And so uh, this gentleman was looking through the honor code and it said, I will abstain from coffee. And he said, well, I, you know, I'm not a member of the church. I drink coffee. And the people that were helping him sign go, oh, don't worry about that. That's okay. And he said, well, no, I'm not going to sign this because I am going to drink my coffee. And they said, no, no, really, you don't have to worry about it at all. He wouldn't do it. He would, and it went, you know, back up the chain. There's this big problem. You know, he, they can't sign off on him being here because he won't sign this document. He won't sign the document because he has the integrity to say, um, I drink coffee. I will not sign something that doesn't say I drink coffee. So that's when UVU, Utah Valley University, stepped in and said, hey, we're more than happy to have the program over where we are. So as I understand it, BYU students go over to UVU. But anyway, this was years ago, but a very interesting story. I thought about um, somebody with integrity who said, no, I won't sign if I don't intend to do it or not do it. I and guess. and so, I've got to think that uh, a lot of non-members that attend BYU drink coffee. That's uh -huh. tea. I'm, I mean, that's yeah. a standard drink for most people who are not yeah. LDS. Uh, so. I know. To, to and again, I'm just so surprised. I really felt like this last time around that they might take it even out of just stop asking the question in the temple recommend, just stop asking it. And then it just kind of fades away, you know, but they still seem to double down. But for what I'm seeing, people from all walks of life in Mormonism have discovered, you know, coffee, especially tea, especially and, tea. And we know that it's not doctrine. It's not a command. No, um, no. The, the mm -hmm. pioneers coming across the plains brought yep and drank coffee with them. Yep. That's after the word of wisdom was given. It was only when the church said, well, if uh, Joseph Smith said it, it's good enough to be. And they made yeah. it a policy. They could unmake right. it a policy just as easily. Uh, but for some reason, uh, you know, the culture mm -hmm. is that, that you don't do it. And I don't think they'll ever undo it. Uh, yeah, maybe. but I feel that everyone is doing it. Because I think everyone <laughs> anecdotally, doing I've it. seen everyone doing it. So I don't know. Comment. Leave it in the comments. Are you guys seeing a resurgence of people just saying, you know what? I'm just going to, you know, think about back in the day, grandma's drinking postum, all that. I mean, yeah. everyone has always done it. So, but anyway, here it is in the... Uh, in the honor code, don't do it. So another one that's very interesting, big brother and sister, um, encourage others in their commitment to comply with the honor dress, the honor code and dress and grooming standards. So uh, we have a picture of some people with binoculars looking out their blinds. I can attest to this on so many levels um, as far as turning it into a police state and people reporting each other. Um, I have so many stories, I, I don't even know where to begin on this. And one thing that was pretty common, and again, I was there in the mid 80s and to the early 90s as a student and then an employee. Um, if you were called into the bishop, if you could rat out somebody else that was doing something worse, you often would not get in trouble. So if you were called in because you were wearing shorts that were sh too short, you could say, yeah, but my roommate had her boyfriend over, you know, and then they would forget about you and they'd call in the roommate. So um, it was very much like that. You definitely told on people. Um, you definitely kept an eye out for people and what they're, and you were just aware in general of what other people were doing and whether or not they were complying to the standards. So these, these I don't know. Did stories, you have any of that at YouTube? At no, no. <laughs> these stories, I, when I listen yeah. to you talk and tell these stories, I'm yeah, just blown I away. I, this, this is like, this is like East Germany. This is like North yeah. Korea, where you spy on your neighbors and you turn yeah. on them to give the yeah. police state something to keep them away from you. Yeah. I, I can't believe I, and, and it's not just you. I've heard these stories from. Yeah. Uh, I've heard 
Uh, you know, we've got some uh, gay members in our book club who have yeah. talked about uh, these undercover stings to try to flush out gay people. Yeah. And, and that was uh, happening when I was there. And I will tell all our viewers that we are doing an episode about this. We are gathering um, some wonderful people from that era who were targeting, targeted in this system. And we're going to have Ooh, it's going to be quite an episode as they have not talked about this for over 40 years and they're going to join us here on Mormonish and that'll be coming out um, probably a month or so from now. But, but yeah, no, it's very real. I mean, it, it happened to me when, I'll, okay, I'll confess this. So I would stay over with my then fiance, you know, sometimes I would be late at his apartment and that's fine because everybody did that at BYU. Uh, but he had a roommate who was, uh, had a drinking problem and somebody turned that roommate in for his drinking problem. And when he was talking to the bishop, he said, well, I may be drinking, but Rebecca's over late every night. You know? and so then I found myself holding, you know, it just, it's such a unhealthy and, and this scenario. Is not, you weren't staying overnight. You were just, no, no curfew. Yeah. Yeah. There was curfew, you which, know, but which back every college student knows yeah. you're hanging out with your boyfriend, girlfriend yeah. until all hours of the night. Yeah. Yeah. It was exactly like that, but just everything, you know, see, you were always just kind of making sure, you know, what is happening and, and, you know, even you, it would depend on what kind of roommate you had. If you had a very sort of strict follow the rules roommate, you know, then you're like, oh, my semester is going to be horrible. Like you couldn't listen to music. They would tell you, oh, that's not appropriate music. Or, you know, everybody was policing each other with their different standards based on how they were raised as a Mormon. As we all know, there are different kinds of Mormons, you know, and some people are okay with one thing. Some people are not okay. So it was definitely an environment um, where we were all encouraged to keep each other in line. And it sounds like from this statement here that that's still happening. Yeah, it's it's inter yeah, it hasn't gone away in the since you mm -hmm. went to school. It's, it sounds mm -hmm. like it's just as much encouraged at this point. So. Yep, and I'm sure if you guys want to comment, you all have stories like that. I mean, I've had horror stories of people heard horror stories of people getting kicked out because of what roommates reported, true or not, things like that. So, I know that happens and it's unfortunate. And again, I question, can you know all this before you go to a church school? I don't know if you really understand or know. You know, I don't yeah. know if you know what you're signing up for. So, I would agree with that because I've never heard of any of this. <laughs> yes. So the biggest uh, addition um, and the title is what has changed for LGBTQ students. So um, I kind of gathered a couple paragraphs here. Landon, why don't you read those? Because there were some changes. Well, uh, actually, the church claims that there weren't any changes. Uh, OK, that's sorry. the first thing here. They say <laughs> there are no changes to the LGBTQ policies. CES is deeply committed to helping all our students, including our LGBTQ students, fill both the love and covenant expectation of the Savior. Same-sex romantic behavior has been and continues to be contrary to the principles included in the CES Honor Code. LGBTQ students are a welcomed and valued part of the campus community and share a common identity with every student as sons and daughters of God. All students will continue to be encouraged to live their gospel and university college commitments. So they are all welcomed and loved as long as they don't love anybody else. Uh, they're welcome, <laughs> it sounds like. Um, okay. <laughs> and, and that continues to be the same policy. They say they have yeah. not changed that. Um, second, the honor code includes the commitment to live a chaste and virtuous life, including abstaining from any sexual relations outside of marriage between a man and a woman. New language clarifies living a chaste and virtuous life also includes abstaining from same-sex romantic behavior. So I take that to be no holding hands, no kissing, yeah, anything, anything, anything that's anything. same sex. Exactly. Um, and last, same-sex romantic behavior is not compatible with the principles included in the CES Honor Code. As in years past, each situation will be handled on a case-by-case -case basis to help each student feel the love of the Savior and to encourage them to live their gospel covenants and university college commitments. Yep. So I feel like they went there and they said it. Do you feel that way? Because yeah. there have been some changes back and forth. People have misunderstood. They thought that it's more inclusive back and forth. And now here I feel, I think it's funny that the headlines are all, we can wear shorts. When to me, this really is the headline right here. They came out and they said it. What's always been under the surface. Here it is. 
So in black and white. Yeah, we know at BYU a couple of years ago when they they made a change in, and they removed some of the language from the honor code and people came right, out. Which oh, is, yeah, now we can do it. They've removed it. Uh, they're right. going back and doubling down and saying, no, you yeah. can't. Yeah. Uh, this no, you can't. is not acceptable at the church school. Right. And I feel like doing this is so unusual. We were talking the other night at dinner, remember about the Pac-12 and, you know, just as BYU tries to be on a more international um, well, platform they're going, they're or a national the platform. Big 12. Yeah, oh, the Big 12. The sorry, big not 12. the Pac. Oh, I'm going to get so many comments on that. Please don't comment. I'm sorry. I said the wrong thing. I apologize. It's the Big 12. Okay. We're going to have to delete that because I'm going to get so many comments. Which, 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 which is kind of interesting because, you know, they're cheered on by the Big 12. The the, the 12. The Big 12. Yes. The big, that, very <laughs> ironic. But anyway, the point is, I just feel like some of these schools, if they understand that this is actually written into their policies of their school, that they might, I don't know, protest they might have a problem with this i mean yeah I we know, know what happened when they excluded blacks uh that's what i'm saying the, uh, uh, yes they, they excluded black players and black people yep. from uh, the yep. school and people stopped uh you know teams yep. rejected stopped them. engaging yeah, yeah. The university so anyway being the biggest one of those i think that yeah. So to me, this is the most uh, disappointing change that they made. And this probably actually needs a whole episode of its own to discuss this. Maybe we'll have Melissa on to talk about this. And um, but yeah, they they did do it. That's the new language. If you guys want to look, um, you can go. I'm going to put copies of all of these documents that they changed in the show notes. So if you want to go through yourself and see what you think and, and read things up close and personal and, and make your own decision uh, conclusions, Please do, but but this is uh this is what they've added right there. So no um, same sex romantic behavior. Okay, so that finishes the honor code. We've gone through the dress and grooming. We've gone through the honor code, and now the last thing that they changed was the student ecclesiastical endorsement questions. So as I talked about before, when you want to apply to a church school, your leader has to like your bishop has to give you. Um, a ser ask a series of questions or just do a check-in with you because they have to give you an endorsement. They have to sign off. Now, as an employee, you also had to do that. And I've told the story many times about, you know, going in for my employee endorsement and admitting I wasn't a full tithe payer and he wouldn't sign it. And I almost lost my job. So this, you know, your leader, your ecclesiastical leader is the gatekeeper for you to be able to attend school or even work at a church school as an employee. So um, it says the updated student ecclesiastical endorsement questions asked by a student's ecclesiastical leader no longer includes questions about the CES honor code or specific dress and grooming standards. So they've changed it. It used to be, and I'll read the statement from below, sort of informal. Um, the formal ecclesiastical endorsement questions were... Uh, the rules are, to be honest, don't engage in premarital sex, don't use profane language, abstain from substance um, substances, go to church, keep the honor code, and ask your friends to keep the honor code. Will you do that? So it was extremely informal as you just talked to your ecclesiastical leader. And, and I think the thought is they know you. You've grown up in their ward, probably, you know, you're a senior, you're applying. And so they just do a check-in with you and they sign off on it. So that's how it was in the past to get an ecclesiastical endorsement. And you can see those questions there. So now they've really made a big change to that. Let's go to the next slide. They have literally turned it into what to me, I don't know if you agree with this, Landon, is like a temple recommend interview. It's a very specific series of questions that you have to answer yes or no to. Instead yeah. of just to check in with your leader, just how are you? What's going on? Do you think this is a, a fit for you? Let's talk about... This is now a Temple Recommend interview. Why don't you read these questions, Landon? And, and again, these are asked to anyone who is thinking of attending a church school. In order to apply, you have to have this ecclesiastical endorsement. Yeah, there's 12 of them, uh, ironically. 12. So these are the Big 12 again. Uh, we keep <laughs> seeing this. The Big 12 questions to get in. Are you striving to deepen your testimony of God, the Eternal Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost? Are you striving to deepen your testimony of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you striving for moral cleanliness in your thoughts and behavior? Do you obey the law of chastity? Do you sustain the first presidency in the quorum of the 12 apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators? Do you support or promote any teachings, practices, or doctrine contrary to those of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? 
Do you regularly participate in your church meetings and strive to keep the Sabbath day holy? Do you strive to be honest in all that you do, including keeping the commitments you have made? The church educational system is supported and funded by the tithes of the Church of Jesus Christ. Are you a full tithe payer? Do you obey the word of wisdom? Are you striving to live the teachings of the church and keep the covenants you have made to this point in your life? And are there serious sins in your life that need to be resolved with priesthood authorities as part of your repentance? It's This is basically the Temple Recommend interview. I'm very triggered even hearing you read yeah. those because I know you were in a bishopric before I knew you. I never knew you as an active member, but I can see you now out there saying this to people. You kind of got your TVM face on there. So yeah, this is an absolute, you know, are you, will you, you know, it is a Temple Recommend interview. Yeah. Why do you think they made that change? Um, I think they're trying to get uh, everyone to be temple worthy, uh, even if they haven't made the covenants to do so, uh, because that's how they're going to, that they, they don't want anyone who is not them uh, at the school. Yeah. They don't want diversity. They want everybody who conforms and, and uh, follows these, which is, which is sad because part of the university uh, experience is to learn uh, other people, to see and experience other ways that other people think, the way they live, the way they act. That's part of a university education. So to make everybody exactly the same just seems uh, uh, absurd to me. Absurd. No, but I mean, think about all the activism that we have seen lately at church schools. We have seen rallies. We have seen protests. We have had Things happened that led to the musket talk, telling students and employees to knock it off. So I feel like they're trying to double down on the front end. And like you said, make sure that everybody who enters the school is of a certain mindset because they I don't think they want any of that anymore. Yeah, I agree. Yep, it's interesting. So I came across a really interesting comment on Reddit because, of course, everybody is just buzzing about this, mostly the shorts, which is so funny to me because it's the most superficial part of all these changes. But I came across on Reddit a post um, from somebody who said that they were a bishop. And I thought this was very interesting. If you want to read this, uh, Landon. Sure. I have been serving several years as a bishop. The ecclesiastical endorsement process was hard enough for me when it was just telling kids to be honest, not have sex, swear, and obey the word of wisdom. These new questions are only for those that are temple worthy. It's like the leadership of the church is not aware they are losing the vast majority of the younger generations. Let's make the overwhelming exodus of our youth, youth worse. Doesn't seem like a good strategy for the church right now, but that's what it appears to be doing. The good news is it will hopefully dissuade most kids from wanting to attend a church school, which is a good thing in my book. Wow, that's wow. a good ship. <laughs> yeah, so I'm saying we understand this person's perspective um, for sure. But yeah, you look at that and he's just like, this is not, you know, I think sometimes we forget that leaders are put in a really rough position having to enact all of these policies and things that they, we have, that they have to do. And so I thought this was actually even kind of, kind of poignant in a way, you know, he's just not on board with what's happening. Well, I, I completely understand this perspective um, because first off, not going to a church school I don't I don't understand this need for all of these codes. One of the things I read, uh, they said, you know, people choose to work and to go to school here and they want to be this way. Well, if they want to be this why, way, why do we need to make so many rules and enforcement of them wanting to do this? If they want to do it, they can do it. I went to, uh, you know, I was an active member, return missionary. I went to U uh, Utah State University. I wanted to live this way. That's how, you know, I was going to live my life. And I followed it. I didn't have an honor code. I didn't have uh, an a ecclesiastical endorsement. I didn't have these required dress and grooming standards. I self-imposed those on myself because yeah. that's what you do when you believe in something. You don't need- and You were in a co-ed dorm. You were in a co-ed dorm, I wasn't right? in a co-ed dorm. We had we had a women's dorm and a men's dorm. Okay, uh, but I mean, it was all very- each other, But you could come in and out. Uh, right. Anyone could have a, a girl stay in their dorm if they wanted to. Right. That was their choice. And it didn't, I, I wasn't, oh my gosh, I got to leave the 
my school because I, saw <laughs> I gotta have a girl in my room. Yeah, yeah I see yeah. my neighbor doing it, or you know, my neighbor's wearing dolphin shorts. I gotta wear them. Too. I gotta wear. Yeah, them. that's what's no. so funny. The only thing stopping people, there's no inner moral compass, is what they're implying. The only thing stopping you is to completely not know any other lifestyle or any other thing. Instead of like you, Landon, saying, "No, I choose to be how I am. You do you. I'll do me, and I'll follow my own." And, and, know, and it's compass. actually very enticing when you have all of these rules that you're going to try to break them. I, uh, of course. I remember when I got out of when I when I graduated from college, I, I graduated, I became a second lieutenant in the Army and I went to what's called officer basic course. Uh, when I showed up there, here came a group of West Point graduates. And of course, you know, when you think West Point graduate, you're thinking, wow, these are, you know, the top of the right. top. And right. oh my gosh, those those kids were so infantilized because they had for four years of college, they'd been told where to be, when to be at dinner, what to dress, what to wear, when they had to go to bed, when they had to wake up. So even though these are the most brilliant leaders for the first six months, they were just, you know, they, they went wild. They were out drinking every <laughs> night because they finally had some right. freedom Unleashed. to go do something Unleashed. and yeah. and then they calm down and and they they will they are they're brilliant you know they're brilliant people great leaders right. but when you have this when you're tightened down like this there's this point where you just say oh I'm I'm going to break free of that I got to be yeah. myself a little bit and yeah. you actually rebel against it so <laughs> to me the people who were the most level were the people who interacted with the world and made choices and guided their life based on what they actually believed rather than what was forced upon them. And to me, that's the true test of what you believe and what your faith is. And that's the true honor code. Are you true to yourself and what you believe? Right. If you can't be true to yourself and what you believe, some honor code isn't going to, isn't going to do it to You're you. Not gonna make a difference. You're always going to find a way around. Is, is ridiculous to me. Yeah. Uh, not having attended. Uh, and when I no, see and we could... stories, I just go, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but my stories are great. I mean, they seriously. are great. It, they was, are great. it was the wild west and heyday at BYU. I am not kidding that mid eighties. Oh my gosh. I can't even tell you the things that happened, but again, also agency. I mean, you could make this, you know, broad parallel to saying agency of being able to make decisions and face consequences and all of Isn't that this and... Satan's plan we're come to come to our <laughs> school and we're going to force you to choose right you won't have to, you can't not go to church you can't not pay your tithing you can't we will force you or we will kick you out of the school i thought that was satan's plan but in <laughs> should the church... that be the title of our thumbnail <laughs> new ces changes satan's plan Satan, no, that's I so clickbaity so. i'm not going to do it but <laughs> Oh, well, I hope that this was useful to everybody. I know that everybody's been talking about it. And again, we're going to link each of these new documents into the show notes. And so go ahead and look through them yourself, you know, because it is, you know, it's a little microcosm. It's the church schools at CES, but it definitely bleeds out into everything in the church and the way that people are treated and the way that you're allowed to use agency or make your own decisions, discipline, temple recommend interviews, you know, and being able to go to the temple, all of that, I think it's very relevant, don't you, Landon? Oh, I th I think it bleeds. It, it it creates a dual citizenship in the church. Those mm -hmm. that are going to a church school, and those that are regular people who make choices on their own. Uh, yeah. There, there's two yeah. completely different stu categories of students or young people, because young people may not go to school; they may just go get a job or whatever. And they're in a completely different world than those that are going to a church school that have have to have these special protections put around them, uh, yeah. a bubble put around them where a the bubble. rest of the kids are sent out to the world and they seem to navigate it pretty well. Yep. It's interesting. Well, please leave us your comments. Tell us about your experiences at a church school, if you have any, um, and tell us what you think about all of these changes. Um, if you have kids that are in the middle of all this, um, let us know what your kids think. I mean, those are the people that are on the ground there um, living and dealing every day with these changes. We'd love to hear all this and start a dialogue. So um, please like and subscribe Mormonish. And if you would like to be notified when new episodes uh, pop up, go ahead and hit the notification bell and that will happen for you. Thank you, everybody. And we will sign off now for Mormonish. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. 
You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.